This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we drug him off the beach to uh, get us back in, in gear here, Mr. Chris Breen. Chris, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, and it's a little hot at the beach today. We're going through a heat wave here in California, and it's bloody hot outside. And so it's probably best that I'm not at the beach right now. I'd be burned to a crisp. Now, what qualifies as a heat wave, Chris? Well, right now it's about 89 here. Oh, in, wow. How yeah, do you... What, Hang on. It's going to get hotter tomorrow and the day after. It's going to get into like the hundreds. So oh. for this area, that's really, really hot. Yeah. Okay. Well, when you start talking those kind of numbers, yeah, that's hot. That's yeah. hot. Okay. So a number of things have changed since you were here last. Um, huh. You know, I, I don't know. I, I think there was a little bit of a Macworld news that uh, – a lot of people are curious about to see where you stand and where everything else stands. What can you tell us? Well, um, sure. The day after the um, September 9th event that Apple held where they announced the new iWatch. Sorry, not iWatch. Apple Watch. I <laughs> I'm saying that. I've done the same thing. <laughs> we all say it. Uh, and the new iPhone 6 and the 6 Plus and all kinds of stuff. Um, the next day... A large portion of the Macworld staff and other people who worked for IDG were laid off. And it was a very sad day. It was one of those days where um, they really cut a lot of people for the, I mean, for understandable reasons because of the state of publishing. But um, still, it's hard because these are people who are not only your colleagues, but your friends, and their jobs have just disappeared. So we have a much smaller staff now. Um, the print edition of Macworld as of November. That's the last issue, so it should be shipping soon. And uh, hang on to it, because that will be your very last printed issue. We're going to continue doing the digital issue of, um, of Macworld. And the uh, website, of course, rolls on just as it always has. But um, you know, the big change is that there are an awful lot of bylines that you used to read that you will no longer be able to read because they no longer work for us. Okay, you know we don't want to belabor this, but there are a couple things I want to make sure we get out here. But first, sure. you just you just whipped one on me that I didn't expect. The digital version will continue to be published. Yeah, that's the plan. I'm not sure how this is going. I mean, that's kind of above my pay grade. Right. But my understanding is that if you've been getting the Zinio edition, um, and also I think we have some other kind of edition, that that is going to continue. We when people were laid off, they kept a few people. They kept me. Um, they kept Rob Schultz, who's our designer, and he's the guy who designed the magazine in the past. So what we've been doing in print for a long time, the last couple, two or three years, is taking material from the website and then converting it into a form for the printed page, so, as well as the digital edition. So the printed page part of it is disappearing, but the digital edition, from what I've heard, is going to continue on. So if you have a digital subscription, then you can continue receiving that. If you have a print edition, I believe that the November issue is going to have something in it that explains what your recourse is, that you know they're not just going to keep your money and stuff in their pocket and say, ah, too bad, you're renewed and, uh, and we're going to keep your dough. Uh, there's going to be some kind of compensation. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, there will be some kind of recourse. Good, good. I've, I'm a little embarrassed. I've kind of forgotten about the Zinio edition of Macworld, so that's still out there and I'll... I'll see if I can find links to anything else that has anything to do with any other digital editions of Macworld so folks can go and even if they can't get the physical thing, maybe if they're really desperate, they can get that version and print it out. I don't know why you want <laughs> If to. you like paper that much. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you're not going to get that nice, thin little magazine kind of slick paper. You'll, yeah. You know, it'll be like on Xerox paper, which will be an interesting experience, I think. Well, you could always go to Office Max and buy really nice paper. Yeah, I suppose you could. You yeah. could do it on photo paper, so it's really glossy. Wow, this is very nice. <laughs> and you know, there's somebody out there right now planning to do exactly that. 
Well, make two copies. I would love to have one myself. That sort of, you know, this ultra swank sort of Japanese style of printing where, the, you know, the paper is just amazingly good and it's really thick and yeah. wonderful. <laughs> so you, you're continuing on. You're a senior editor. You retain that title and you'll keep on going. Who is it fair to ask who's running the show right now? Sure. Um, overarching boss is John Phillips, who has been in the publishing business forever. Uh, he's not that old, so I won't say forever. But he was at Wired. He's been at PC World. He's done Condé Nast stuff. Uh, so he's a vet. He was running PC World before. Now he is uh, running the four brands that we have, which is TechHive, GreenBot, Macworld, and PC World. Um, and then each brand has its own executive editor. Our executive editor is Susie Oaks. She came from Mac Life originally. She was the executive editor over there. She's been working for us for a year. And then uh, Leah Yamshan, who's been working for us for three years, she was doing tech bot, uh, tech hive stuff. Uh, but she's really a Mac person at heart. We had her at Mac World for a while. When tech hive came along, they stole her away, and we've stolen her back. Um, then we have Caitlin McGarry, who's our news person in New York. And this is the first time we've had a news person since Jim Dalrymple and Peter Cohen were working for us. And that was a long time ago. In the past, we sort of picked up news where we could, but now we have a dedicated person. So you're going to see more timely stories um, when there are events breaking. Caitlin's all over this stuff. So I th expect you to see like three or four stories from her a day, which is great. It's nice to have that resource. But Susie is in charge. And, um, and I'm really glad because one, nobody offered me the job, which is great because I don't like managing people. <laughs> um, the other is that um, Jason Snell is also gone. He was the guy who was running things before. If you've looked at his website, um, which is sixcolors.com, it's an Apple-centric website, and he also does a lot of podcast stuff for the Incomparable ne Network that he's founded. He sort of editorialized about the change and why he chose to leave and what he's doing now. And one of the things he said is that even though I suppose it's great to be the big cheese, he missed making things. He missed creating things things. Uh, and that meant writing and podcasting and doing videos and all the stuff that we originally got into the business for. And when I was originally hired as an employee at Macworld versus being a freelancer forever, um, part of the deal was that I got to continue just doing what I do. Those were the terms of my employment. And that meant I didn't have to manage people. I didn't have to do much editing of other people's stuff. But I got to do exactly what I love doing, which is writing, which is doing podcasts, which is making videos editorializing, reviewing, kind of the jack-of-all-trades things where I am that guy that Jason wants to be, where I get to create stuff every single day. I love doing that. Um, had anybody said, well, you've been around a long time, so I think you should be running Macworld, I would have said, no, thank you. I don't want to do that because it would take me away from what I'm good at and what I really love doing into doing something that I would probably hate after a while because it's... Um, it's not up to me to set editorial direction. I, you know, I throw out my thoughts now as I did before, but really I like being a creator and, and dealing with a material and, and producing stuff for readers. And that's, um, that's my real joy in life. So that's how that's worked out. And, and knowing you, I have to say that's not, those are not the statements of someone who did get passed over and is, is just trying to justify it. That's just not you. I've, I, I've, I've honestly believed that if they had said, you know, okay, Chris, it's yours, you'd have said no, give it to somebody else. Cause, you know, <laughs> I would have said, give me a package and let me out of here. Yeah, I, I want to um, hang out on the beach. Why, yeah, why yeah. wouldn't I? <laughs> no, it's, I know that the people really like doing that stuff, um, but I don't. I think, you know, a, a few years ago I was talking to somebody higher up at Macworld and said, you know, really, you ought to, you know, you should think about, you know, do it, taking more of a managerial position. I said, no, I won't. I will leave before I'll do that. Um, and it's not just understanding what, where your strengths are and trying not to rise above that. But, um, you know what, I've managed to get through life pretty much doing exactly what I want. Um, I started working as, when I got out of college, I became a preschool teacher, which I absolutely loved doing. I did that for four years. And then I was a musician for 13 years, and I loved doing that. And then I was a writer and then a tech guy, and I loved doing that. So I'm old enough now that I can kind of see where my career ends, um, and I'm just trying to get across that finish line so that I can have things exactly <laughs> my way and be really selfish about it and not you know spend my last 
five or six years in my career in a position where I'm unhappy, where I'm not getting to do all the things that I wanted to do. Because once I cross that retirement finish line, I get to say, I won and, uh, and be very happy with, with the way my life has turned out. And we all know, and not talking behind anybody's back, because Jason has sort of acknowledged it, we all know people that have climbed that ladder or been promoted into things, and they ended up, while it looks good and you know, it's always always feels good to be promoted, you suddenly look yeah. around and find yourself very unhappy. And I can't imagine anything worse than getting up every day and going to a job that you're not happy with. That's just... I've done it, and it's terrible. And folks, if you haven't done it, don't do it, please. Yeah, yeah. I haven't talked to Jason about you know his feelings about all this stuff. I'm sure he has mixed feelings about it. He did some really wonderful things. Um, he was one of the people that really understood where print and digital was going a long time ago, where our focus at that time was all about print. And we sort of said, oh, well, we'll take some articles and we'll put them on the web. And once he came in and got into a position where he could make these kinds of decisions, he said, well, this isn't, you know, print is, is going out. So there's no reason we should ride that till the end. Instead, what we ought to be doing is focusing on the web and then taking that content and putting it in print. And that's basically what our model became after a couple of years. And we've been doing that for uh, six, seven years, and largely because of Jason's direction and, and seeing into the future and understanding what the important thing was to do there. So he can be very proud of that. I mean, he really made a huge difference at Macworld and then IDG in general because that spirit then spread out through, throughout a very large organization and people started looking to him. It's like, oh, this guy gets it. He's an inspiration. So, um, but, you know, running things for a while and uh, print is, uh, publishing in specifically, is very challenging these days. So it's not like it was in the old days. Um, and so I would think that given all the challenges that any print publication has, whether it's a newspaper, books, magazines, even online content, that you're facing a ton of challenges everywhere. And I would think you get burned out after a while. I think there are some people that thrive on that challenge. If it were me, I'd put up with it for about a week and then cry <laughs> and say, I'm going to the beach if you need me for anything. Thank you. <laughs> and don't call. And please don't call because I get no reception there. Oh, I fell in the ocean. Sorry. <laughs> I want to go down the, the, the publishing direction. Um, but there are a couple things I want to finish up with Macworld first. Mm -hmm. First of all, um, Susie Oaks is the the what, edit, senior editor, or no, no, editorial she's executive director, editor. executive editor. Right. Uh, she also has another title, and that is she's now the new co-host with Mr. Chris Breen on the MacWorld podcast. Right. Yeah, Serenity Caldwell and I did the podcast before. We've we've gone through various iterations of this thing. Before it was me hosting and then interviewing people, um, much like this format, and then. We, I was doing it every other week, and the the people in the office would do it sometimes, and then the schedule just got kind of screwy. Um, so we came up with a new format, which is getting more popular, which is a couple of people talking about the day's news or the week's news. And so Ren and I did that, and we did that for almost a year, I think. And then she has moved on to iMore, which good for her. Um, she actually had made these plans before the layoff was announced, so. She's going to go work with Renee and Peter Cohen and all the great people over at iMore. So it was it was sad to see her go because we had established a nice rapport with the podcast. And I very much like Serenity. She's really talented. And um, it's heartening to see young people like that come up who are really smart and really enthusiastic. And, you know, you, you sort of trust the future of publishing to people like, like Ren. Um, but she made that decision. I think it was a great decision because I, I can't think of a better place to go than iMore. And so um, that left a hole. We had the layoffs, and we said, okay, mm, what are we going to do now? Well, we, I still like the format of the two people talking. Susie's in charge. She's got a great vision. She's very smart, um, and she's fun to talk to. We had, we've done one podcast so far, and the rapport was just instantly there. I thought the, the show worked really well. She was very comfortable with it. She laughed at my jokes, so she's awesome. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. Every Monday we'll record one, and uh, I think they'll come out on Tuesday. So that we're a little more time than they used to come out on Wednesday, and that was by that time certain things would have happened, and we wanted to be more, more timely about stuff. But, yeah, I think, um, I think if, you know, if you have to make that kind of transition, it's, it's been a good one. I, I think this is going to be a good partnership. 
from someone sitting over out, out here, you know, when, when all these layoffs happened, there's a concern about what's going to happen. You know, how is obviously Macworld is going to change? How's it going to change? Then Serenity, you know, it became known that she was leaving um, mm -hmm. under her own power, by the way. Right. And, you know, then it's okay. So what happens to the podcast and who are we going to get and how's it going to evolve? And I, I, I don't know Susie, but I was very impressed with the first uh, show that you all did. Um, she does. She comes across as very sharp, very, very quick, um, you know, good personality. And mm -hmm. I just overall, I thought, okay, this this is different, but I think it's going to be okay. And that is a really good thing because, you know, it, it's tough to see your friends. I mean, I know a lot of the people that, that lost their jobs at Macworld, and some of them are, I consider friends. And yeah. it's just tough. It's tough. So, you know, glad that you're still there. Glad that Susie seems to be taking charge and, and is projecting just exactly what we need. And that is, you know, the genuine interest in the Mac community and the Apple community that is, is the hallmark of Macworld. Right. And, you know, I don't want to come across as the company guy who's sugarcoating this and saying, this is great. You know, no, this is no. an awesome new beginning because clearly it's not. I, again, I've lost friends. Um, we've lost resources, too. There are certain things we're not going to be able to do. And a lot of this is sort of we're going to focus on on our core mission, which is Apple stuff, right? Um, but in the old days, we had the resources when Macworld was this thick. We could cover everything. So it wasn't just Mac stuff, but it was cameras and speakers and microphones and all kinds of peripherals. Clearly, we don't have that kind of uh, bandwidth anymore to do that sort of thing. So, yes, we're going to focus more on the core mission. Um, it's going to be different than, than what we had before. But... Um, you know, given Susie's leadership, I've I've liked a lot of things that have come from John in terms of direction. So we'll see. I think it's I think it, we have a good chance of carrying on. It's going to be different than than what you've experienced before, but um, I don't think it's going to be worse. It's just going to be different. Yeah, and that's you know that's fine. I mean, it's a, it's an evolution, and it's we use that word a lot. It seems like in the tech community, but that's mm -hmm. the way it is. Last thing before we leave the, the, the Macworld evolution, um, yeah. and that is I want to commend you for a, an excellent post to your own blog about your, your co-workers, your former co-workers. Um, I, I thought it showed a lot of class. I thought there was a lot of information there that a lot of folks might not have known about all these people whose bylines we read all the time. And I, I, I just thought it was an absolute class move. So good job. Oh, well, thanks. For those who don't know, it was um, my website is chrisbreen.com and it's a post called Letter of Recommendation. It's basically, it's, you know, when people get laid off at any company, they, may, they keep it very quiet, you know, because it's kind of like ripping the band aid off rather than doing a slowly thing where people go, oh, you know, am I going to lose it? It's just, I think various studies have shown you do it a certain day, a certain time, and you do it quick and you get it over with. And, um, and I thought, you know what what Macworld was able to say about it was fine. But I as as they're friends of mine and colleagues, I, I did think that they deserved a little more um, explanation about you know who they are and what they've done. People have been reading their bylines, but I actually work with them day in and day out. So it was called Le letter of recommendation essentially so that one I could provide a link to each one of their Twitter accounts so people could contact them if they had work for them. And also describe what I thought were their strengths. Um, they're all really, really, really good people. You don't work at Macworld unless you're really good at your job. And so the layoff was no reflection on anybody's ability. It was just a financial thing. And um, I wanted to be able to, to say, you know, these are terrific people. You should hire them. There are a lot of them out there now, but you'd be lucky to have them. And so um, yeah, I keep up with them still, you know, check in with them, see how they're doing. And, and people have been getting in touch and, and uh, talking to them about doing different kinds of work. But, um, you know, when somebody means that much to you and, and does such great work, I think that there should be a place to honor them. And that, that was basically what that was about. And I will have a link in the show notes in case you can't figure out how to spell chrisbreen.com <laughs> and, uh, and, and go and check it out. There's a dot in it. Yeah. It's, I, I, think there, I think there's a lesson there for a, a lot of us who have had coworkers laid off. And, you know, you want to do something. I just thought the, the way you addressed it was just absolutely perfect. So good deal. Good deal. Well, thanks. 
Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. This time around, let's talk about PDF Pen 6 and PDF Pen Pro 6, both for the Mac OS. I've had emails from viewers who ask why I rave about these two utilities, since PDFs are, to their way of thinking, somewhat immutable documents that are for viewing only. And that's true, if you don't have PDF Pen 6. But if you do, a whole new level of usefulness opens up. You can edit and correct text, create transparent backgrounds, perform OCR on your PDFs to turn them into text, insert, remove, and reorder pages, even capture PDFs directly from your scanner. You can resample images to reduce file size, an essential task when you're emailing your or anyone else's PDFs, crop pages, create tables of contents, import HTML websites, fill in form fields. I could go on and on. Need to annotate a PDF? Need to redact information so that it can't be seen? Secure it with 256-bit AES encryption? PDF Pen can do all of this and much, much more. Once you start to work with PDF Pen 6, you'll never look at PDFs the same way again. What were once locked down, read-only documents suddenly become as easy to manipulate as any text file. And that will change the way you work. I could keep reading you features from now until the end of the show, but it's much better if you try it yourself. And try it you can, for free. Download a free trial of PDF Pen 6 from smilesoftware.com and give it a shot. You will wonder why you waited this long. Then, buy from the Smile website, or if you want to be able to sync frequently used images, signatures, objects, and text via iCloud, get PDF Pen 6 or PDF Pen Pro 6 in the Mac App Store. PDF Pen, the all-purpose Mac PDF editor from Smile, the makers of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. So, We've talked now about Macworld, so let's zoom out a little bit from the, the microcosm of Macworld. Chris, where, what's, what do you see as the future of, of journalism and publishing in a, in a web-centric world? It seems like there are just amazing number of challenges. Macworld is certainly not the first uh, publication to go down this, this channel. Everybody's trying something, and none of it seems to be working, or at least working as well as they'd like it to. Yeah, I don't think anybody has a formula for it yet, because if they did, a lot of things would be working better than they are. Uh, we've seen this, and, and I think this is, uh, Mackerel is just a lesson, as you say, is part of the, the much bigger picture. If you go back 15 years and you go somewhere that had a newsstand where they had racks of magazines, you would see dozens of tech magazines. If you go back to that same place now, if it's still in business, you will see very few. There may be some from overseas because they're still managing to publish tech magazines there. But in the U.S., they've pretty much dried up. In the Mac business, there's still Mac Life, which uh, Future is still doing. But um, that's kind of it. You know, PC World stopped publishing in print over a year ago. Uh, PC Mag stopped publishing. Byte is gone. Um, all these various magazines, print magazines, are just gone. And it makes sense because we have invoked and invented the Internet where people said, great, we can get all this information. Okay, what does that do for print? Well, it pretty much puts a huge dent in it because why wait around for a month or two months to get information when you can get it right away? It really started with the newspapers. When the Internet came around and people found they could advertise online instead of in the papers, the advertisers said, well, why should I advertise with you when I can advertise to the entire world? So dollars started draining out of there. Then the newspaper said, oh, well, we have an idea. We will, um, we will make our stuff free. We'll put it on the internet for free. And all advertisers will come there because, hey, they want to advertise globally. Well, now people from around the entire world are going to look at these ads. And so it means more ad revenue. And this is great. And sure, who cares about content? We'll just make it all free. Well, then the bottom falls out of everything because of the economy. Big companies start scaling back. So you're not getting the big ad buys from Microsoft and Adobe and Oracle and whoever is spending huge amounts of money. Now they're spending far less money. 
And now those people who have basically taken all the emphasis off print and put it online don't have the kind of ad revenue that they expected to have. They can't very well turn back to their customers, although they tried, or their readers, and say, um, we'd like you to pay for the content. Now, we know it was free before, but now we'd like you to pay for it. And they won't. I mean, no, who was going to... And I, I don't blame them. I'm another free content guy. If I go somewhere and I want to see a news story, and, I've con- and I'm confronted with a paywall, I go somewhere else. Because I, too, am in the habit of just getting everything for free. But then we, have the, we face the problem of, well, okay, well, how do you fund then media, this kind of media. And I don't know what the answer is, because I think the ad dollars aren't there that they once were. People won't pay for content. And um, so what have you got? You know, where's your revenue model there? And, uh, and people have tried an awful lot of things. And you can, make, you can make advertising more obnoxious, but people don't like it. And also, I think we've gotten to the point evolutionarily within ourselves that we start to not see web advertisements anymore. That you have a page full of web ads. You know, if I'm looking at a web page, and I've been there for five minutes, and a minute later you say, name one ad that was on there, I couldn't tell you. And it's because I now subconsciously just ignore them. I don't see that. I just look for the content. That's what I look at. And again, websites are trying to make their ads more obnoxious so that you have to remember them. But the danger there is that you resent it, and so you never go there again. Or you say, I will never buy that product because you shouted at me while I was trying to read this story here. And uh, so I don't think that's the answer either, but I don't know what the answer is, other than you know you sort of have state-funded media, and that, of course, has its own problems as well. So <laughs> Yeah. You yeah, know, we've seen how you well do. that works, yeah. Right, exactly. So... You know, what is it? Do we have to sort of, as a, as a people, say, news is important to us. Media is important to us. Media without a slant is important to us. And so we're willing to pay for that. I have not seen a lot of people line up. There have been many experiments. There was a newspaper, I think it was in Colorado, that was going to go out of print. And everybody was furious with the you know, newspaper magnets who were going to do it. And they said, look, you know, we just can't afford it anymore. It's, the, the dollars don't work out. And so the community was up in arms and said, no, we want this. And so what the staff did is they stayed together and said, okay, we will do an online version of exactly what we've done before. The work is not going to change. And all you have to do is support us, just as you did before. So you used to pay for your newspaper subscription. Do the same thing except for our online outfit. Well, that lasted about six months and because <laughs> people didn't pay. Because, again, you know, they, people say they want this, but then when you come to them with a tin cup and rattle it and say, okay... How about it now? And then, oh, well, I'm sorry. I just, I'm fresh out of cash right now. And that's what happened. So it's, it's part us and it's part the model that uh, publishers set up originally, which kind of tainted the whole thing. And so um, I don't know. I don't think we have an answer. It, it costs money to produce Macworld magazine in whatever format it, it gets produced. It, it costs money to produce this little thing. It's not. It's not nearly what Macworlds is, but you know, right. and you got to find ways to fund it um, because you can only dig out of your po- your own pocket for so long. And I, I I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I think people need to be educated, and it's just it's a back it's no it's not a backlash. It's the result of the the whole free thing, uh, the that whole hacker mentality that everything should be free, information should be, should be mm-hmm. free, everything should be free. Well, you know that sounds good, and there's a certain appeal to it, but at the end of the day somebody's got to get paid. I mean, until, until they start giving away groceries at the grocery store for free, it's, you gotta, you gotta have some cash. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that's the difficult part. I need to get paid. If I can't get paid, I have to go do something else. And right. you know, whatever voice I had of whatever I was doing disappears because, you know, as much as I would love to continue doing this for nothing, um, I can't. I mean, we all have to pay the bills, right? So what what ends up happening is that you do start losing people who are really good, who can't afford to make a living that way anymore, and they end up doing something else. They go into marketing, for example. Um, and so you get people, you know, who will work cheap, um, and then you get you start getting websites that are chasing hits because that's all about, you know, how much Google juice you have and what kind of hits you get. And the easiest way to do that is just make some really stupid headlines that attract people uh, using garish graphics. 
and and it all just makes us dumber. I think you know it it sort of sort of shows the the weak side of humanity that we're easily titillated, and I think it's too bad. And people play on that, right? Because they say, "Oh, you'll you'll look at the three headed baby." And I'm like, oh, no, I won't look at. The- yes, I'll look at the three headed baby because I must. And then it turns out it's three children with three separate heads. Um, but that's you know, and so that's the dark side of it is that. If people are going to go simply for titillation, then the quality of what you're you're experiencing is far lower because it's easy to, to get that Pavlovian response from us, but it's not very enriching. It's like eating cake all the time. You know, it, it tastes good, but then you do it long enough and you just get sick and die. So, in order to have higher quality journalism, you got to pay for it. You, you got to pay for people who are professionals who spend the time to learn their craft, who are smart, who can go out and travel, who can make the effort to talk to people who spend 60 hours a week doing this stuff. And, um, and you got to support them somehow. But uh, again, <laughs> I don't know how to do that except you know, go door to door or find enough people who have decided this is a value and so somehow we're going to do this. I mean, maybe it's public radio that's the model here. They've managed to, as hard hit as they've been over the years, they managed to keep going. And it really is all about being obnoxious two weeks every quarter or so, just saying, please give us money, give us money, give us money. And here's James Taylor. Give us money, give us money. Give us money. <laughs> and here's Garrison Keeler. And give us money, 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 money. Um, but they keep going. And I think the quality of the product is good. I mean, whether, you know, you may disagree with some of the politics of some of this stuff, but you have sincere people who are really working hard to do serious news and commentary versus like, ooh, look at the three-headed baby. <laughs> you know, I guess I was going to pull you on the hot seat, but I think you just said, you know, what What do we tell the, the viewers and the listeners? You know, if they want to support Macworld, if they want to support Mac Voices, if they want to support Newsweek, uh, the, 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 the New York Times, yeah. I mean, do you – I, I I really hesitate to say, please click on the, the sponsor ads if you're not interested because that just seems gratuitous and that seems like it's going to create yeah. its whole own set of problems. Right. So, you know, I don't know. When you make a purchase, do you try to drop a note to somebody and say, hey, I heard about it in Macworld, on Mac Voices, in the New York Times? You know, what what is the best way for people to support in this world? Well, I think because ad revenue is so tied to these sites and Google stuff is so tied to it. Part of it, I think, is just being discerning about what you consume. So rather than click on the three-headed baby and go to some awful website and give them the benefit of this click that they can then take to their advertisers to say, look, we got a trillion clicks because we're showing the three-headed baby, go to places that do serious work and give them the benefit of your click and don't block their ads unless they're autoplay videos in which case totally block their ads but just the <laughs> just the autoplay ones uh, if there's something on there go ahead and click on it or click on an affiliate link this is something that people are starting to do more now so if they review a product and they believe in it and you know and they're good people they're not just trying to get you to buy something because they're going to make money from it but click on their affiliate link so that they get a few cents when you buy the product that they think is great um you know i mean it doesn't cost you anything to do that except your time and your effort um to look for sites that are worth your time that you want to see continue to exist and then avoid those that don't you know, I'll call it the Huffington Post. I think their headlines are horrible. And um, they're shamelessly link baity, and I don't think they should be in business. So um, do me a favor. Don't click on any Huffington Post thing. <laughs> and I agree with their politics. I mean, that's the thing is that I'm very much a left-wing kind of guy. So I have no problem with their politics whatsoever. But I hate the way they deliver their content. And I think it's sleazy. I think Ariana, Ariana Huffington is sleazy for allowing that to happen and promoting that sort of stuff. Um, and I think it's AOL behind it is also doing the same kind of thing. I think it's sleazy, and um, I don't think you should support that sort of stuff. If somebody's going after you for titillation, avoid them and go somewhere that doesn't do that, that treats you like an intelligent person. And there's some sites that cover Apple and and Mac news, 
And I, I, I feel the same way. I feel like the, the titles uh, are often, if I see them go by on Twitter or somebody has retweeted it and it shows up in my stream and it's like, and, and I've, I've been victimized and I've been victimized enough times to say, you know what? Okay, I see where it's coming from and I'm just not going to bother because yeah. it's not, and, and, I've, and I haven't really given it the thought that you just talked about, like, I'm not going to give them my click. I'm just not going to give them my time because I know that it is, it is to one degree or another link bait. They've 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 made their bed. Now they have to lay in it at least with me. <clears throat> excuse me, at least with me for the reputation they've built, which is not a good one. Yeah, and it's no secret who's good out there, right? I mean, Daring Fireball is great. If you want good commentary and great links, John Gruber offers this terrific gateway for this stuff. If you want great content, go there. And maybe he hasn't written all of it. It's, it's links to other stuff, but you know you're going to get good stuff. So he's a good arbiter of what's good out there. Imore is terrific. Um, Mac World, I'll say, is pretty pretty good too. Um, <laughs> putting in a plug for us. Um, <clears throat> Jim Dalrymple's The Loop has good links to it as well, and the commentary there is good. So, and there's there's lots more. I mean, this is the Mac Observer, and I'm now I'm in a position where I'm going to leave somebody out and feel like, oh my yeah. god, we're both going to, uh, yeah, to yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, anybody I've left out, but you're all awesome. I love you all. Um, but there are lots of good places out there to get this site, and generally those that kind of focus on on Mac stuff are pretty good. You know, I think we have far less Drek than. Other sort of disciplines, gaming sites, for example, can be horrible. Um, political sites can be horrible. Um, there are lots of places where things can get really gawkery and, and terrible, uh, entertainment in particular. But I think within the tech world, most of them, at least in our little community, are pretty good. You know, people make an effort to do something intelligent. They're not insulting us with with horrible um, headlines. Or you know, little tiny stories where they're simply just trying to get your clicks. Chris, I'm I'm going to bring up something that I just just came out of my mouth, and that is yep. the the social media part. Um, I'm finding that it's it my my sense is that more and more, and I pop I, I hang around Twitter more than anything else, but you know some Google Plus and that much Facebook. Yep. Um, it seems like snark is is. A huge factor now it, that that people can't comment intelligently on a story, and they can't add to the conversation. They just they have to be snarky about it. And I haven't unfollowed anyone yet, but I'm on on the verge of it. And some people that I like and know, and, and again consider friends, because they just are going down that path constantly, and it really bothers me. And I, I think, okay, is this is this the new pollution to the online world? Snark? Yeah, I. I'm hardly one to stand up here and say that this is something I've never done because I have. I'm I'm guilty of it as much as anybody else. Um, political snark, in particular, people who are on the on the conservative side of politics, unfollow me in droves because <laughs> once the campaign season starts, I I get into it. And I was raised as a political kid. I was raised in a political family, and so that's a very much a part of my being. And I use. Twitter is sort of a reflection of my life rather than my professional life. Um, but I am trying to simmer down a little bit. Um, partly, I'm more visible at Macworld now because there are fewer people there. Not that it's a business account, but I just think more people are paying attention and I should treat them with a little more respect. Um, and then I, I mean, I think everybody looks at their motives for doing things. Part of social media and particularly Twitter, I think is, you know, how many followers can you get? And Part of that is it's you want to get attention. You know, if you just type about what you ate that day or, you know, what the weather is like outside. Or maybe a picture of the beach you've taken. People after a while just go, mm, yeah, yeah, so what? And don't follow you and don't care. And so if you're snarky or you're funny or your your wit is sort of mean, um, you get more attention. You get more uh, retweets that way or people favorite stuff. You know, like, oh, this is funny, but it's kind of mean. And, um, you know, of course, then you get more followers. You get more followers, nothing. <laughs> you just basically have a number. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not like you get paid for it or um, it makes you a better person. You just have more followers. I mean, look at some of the celebrities who have millions of followers, and you think, wow, you're not a very interesting person. Other than that, look at your Twitter stream, but you have 5 million followers. Um, so a part of it, I think, is all of us trying to get over the fact that 
the, the number of followers you have means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Um, except attention, you know, and I think too many people think, oh, well, I need to get more followers because that makes me a better person. And of course it doesn't. It just means you get more attention. So, yeah, I do think, though, I, I was having lunch with Dan Frakes, one of the, my coworkers, ex-coworkers now, and he was talking about Twitter as well, and he said, you know, when I'm on there for about 20 minutes, I start getting snarkier because I'm kind of looking at the world I live in, and you just naturally sort of want to fit in. So um, I'm making more of an effort to not do it, but we talked about this two years ago, and I said the same thing, and then I know I went back to it, so it's <laughs> always a temptation to, um, to go the snark path. But um, I, I don't. I, again, I think it's one of those things where it's eating cake all the time. Where ultimately, it's not very enriching. And so maybe like clicking on good websites, you follow good people and try to follow people who don't get snarky or have the ability to take their hands off the keyboard for about ten seconds. It's not like you need to walk outside and to cool off. It really is. I think a lot of Twitter is so much that instant response, like "Oh, this is funny," without thinking about the consequences of what you're going to do. Or somebody says something that makes you really mad, and so you write in it just like we used to do with email, and it happens so quickly that maybe if you take the ten seconds to just back off and go, "Okay, this isn't worth doing." You know, or type it out and then sit down with your hands behind your back and read it over and over about 20 times and think, what am I adding to the conversation here? And most of the time you may say, nothing. And in that case, delete it and move on. I think I just heard you say that the 24-hour rule has now been revised to the 10-second rule. Oh, yeah. Yeah, forget <laughs> 24 hours. Are you kidding? <laughs> and forget what you were mad about in 24 hours. <laughs> Wow. I think it really is. It's really condensed now. It's like 10 seconds. Because I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm on Twitter. And it's just like bang, 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 send. And, um, and, and honestly, I've, I really try to put just that much gap in there where I can count to 10. And, and that's enough time for me to remind myself like this maybe isn't worth doing. So just don't. Yeah. And, you know, and I've done it too. I mean, we, we all do it. And I think, I think that snark actually has a place. I, there's sure. some, there's some people that do it very very well, and I'm intentionally avoiding calling out anybody on either side of that fence, because in my judgment, you know, this is too much, and over here this is okay, mm -hmm. um, and that might not be your judgment, but there's some people that do it okay, and I I, don't th I think it's fine to do occasionally, as you know, maybe once every tenth or twelfth or fifteenth tweet, or once a day or something, but you know, when it's a steady, it's a, like you say with the cake example, it's a great example when it's a steady diet. Yeah, that just you just can't. You're polluting things. You're not adding to it. Well, and it's also out there forever. And that's um, you know, I look back on my Twitter stream. I wouldn't want somebody reading that, honestly. <laughs> you know, because there's stuff that it's just like I know if I were to because I, I won't read back through my Twitter stream just as I don't listen to my own podcast or any of that stuff. I don't want to know about it. Um, but it's out there. I know it, and there are certainly places that people could pick out two dozen tweets of mine and just say, wow, this guy is really a jerk. Look what he did. And, you know, they could justify by those 12 tweets. On the other hand, I hope that I have 12 or 24 that prove that I'm not a jerk all the time, that maybe sometimes I'm okay. But, um, I mean, that's the danger if you don't use it strictly as a marketing tool, and a lot of people do. If you start sharing your life in any way, there are times when you're crabby and you've, you're in a bad mood or something's going on or something irritates you or you've, you're in, you know, feeling smug about some cause of yours or something. You'll, you'll tweet something and, you know, in the light of passion, it sounds like a really good idea. But then if you go back and look at it six months later, you're kind of, oh, man, that, that one I should have gotten rid of. And I don't, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about how you use Twitter and how you share, share your life. Most people, most people don't have lives worth sharing. I don't think, <laughs> you know. I mean, well, and I, and what I mean by that is, you know, we all get up in the morning, we go to work. Most of us can't tweet about our work, and or you know, or we get in real trouble. Yeah. Um, so you know, you leave that. Well, then you come home, and if you have kids, you got kids, and if you have a dog, you got a dog, and otherwise, you know, it's what what you had for dinner, and maybe what TV shows you enjoy, or what podcasts, what magazines. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never sure exactly kind of what to do with that and why people do it. I, I, 
I personally, I, I like to share the content I create. I like to share the content and I'm trying to find other ways to do it of people that I respect and that, mm-hmm. that, that are giving information, you know, that are making that by reading this, it, it, it enriched me in some way. And so I'm going to share it in the hopes that it will enrich you. Yeah, well, I think that, that was the problem with, when Twitter first came out. A lot of people, you know, the joke was people are tweeting about their breakfast or their lunch and taking pictures of it. Look, here's my breakfast. Um, because I mean, we all have ordinary lives. It's just that some of us are known for certain things. Um, I mean, if I didn't do what I did, if I wasn't a writer for Macworld, I'd have like two followers, you know, and, and they would have unfollowed me about a year ago. So I'd have no followers and I'd still be tweeting and nobody would pay any attention to me whatsoever. Um, so being known certainly helps um, or being part of a community where you where really you like to talk a lot about your particular passion. So whether it's comic books or podcasts or Macs or PCs or horses or whatever it is you're into. If you can get into that little community and then sort of establish little Twitter friends, then there's something more enjoyable about it because you can talk about your passion. So it really is a way of sending like little postcards to people saying, this is what I'm interested in. I think this is great. Somebody's dinging. Hello. Um, so, but otherwise, if you just have kind of a regular life, you know, there are only so many times you can tweet about how awesome your kids are. By the way, my, my child is awesome. Awesome. Just tweet that now. She's awesome. She's awesome. Talking. Yeah. <laughs> I have nothing more to say on you that. You have nothing I'm more just, to say. No, I just think it's, you, you know. You're ending, have, on, you're ending on your daughter is awesome. She is awesome. Okay. That's, I'm just, that's all I'm going to tweet from now on for the rest of my life, how awesome my daughter is. No, because uh, it is. You're right. I mean, there's like a, a service like Facebook as much as I dislike it for its privacy uh, policies, it's actually can be a much richer experience because you're showing pictures of your family. So, you know, all, everybody in my family is on Facebook except me. And they share pictures of, you know, what the grandchild is doing and what this person is doing in the trip to here and there and there. And so you get this real insight into people's lives. Twitter isn't so much. You can do, you can attach pictures, but a lot of times it's sort of the funny pictures. And, um, and your little bits of, and your little tiny thought, which I like because it's more immediate. But um, it, if you tweet too much, and we know people who do, um, eventually you just can't absorb it all, and you just finally mute them. And then they come back up a month later, and you go, "Oh, it's the first. Uh, mute them again." That's how I keep track of time now. Um, but there are ways to use social media in interesting ways. It's just that Twitter is, has its particular challenges because of uh, the nature of the, the short messages and how much you can do with media. And I, well, I, I know you're on Twitter. Um, I know you signed off Facebook a while back. Mm-hmm. Um, are you on Google Plus? Yeah, I've posted, let's see, I've been there about three years and I've posted six times. Okay. Mostly to say, hey, I'm not posting here. <laughs> yeah. I check in about once a year. Say, so nope, still not here. <laughs> um, follow me on Twitter. I'm, you know, on, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm not even sure exactly what the status of App.net is. Um, I, that was an interesting experiment that didn't seem to quite make it, unfortunately. Yeah, that is the info. Okay, okay, going back to publishing, that's the model, right? That we were talking about is that um, App.net, App.net started when it looked like Twitter was going to go down the Facebook path, where they obviously had to make money. The way to do that was push advertising, get as much information from you as they could. And at that point, I think people said, wow, we really like this Twitter-like experience, but we don't like where they're going with it. And so let's do something else. And so they founded App.net, and a lot of people heard about it and said, let's do the right thing. Let's pay them the 50 bucks a year ad free they're going to be respectful of our privacy they're going to give us more space more characters to work with that looked like it had a lot of potential um and i liked it and i was on there but i kept going back to twitter because that's where everybody i knew was so that's the draw of any of these when you kind of get that firm footprint um it's tough then to um to move on to something else where not everybody else is following you particularly when um, there's a barrier, which is money. Because there are a lot of people, again, who won't pay for anything. So what you are ending up with with app.net, at least initially, was people that really believed in this. But it was a very kind of small community, a really smart community. I, I learned a lot of stuff over there, and I enjoyed everything I read. But uh, it just didn't have, the, um, didn't have the numbers 
to keep going, which again is sort of a, a testament to there's quality, but people aren't willing to pay enough for it to keep it alive. And so it makes you kind of go, hmm, well, there's, there's the evidence, again, that something could be done, something great can be done, but, uh, but you need the bodies in there right in the checks. And it's ironic. Twitter seems to be the one, Facebook, for, like you say, for completely different reasons. Twitter seems to hold up pretty well. And Twitter, you know, is trying to inject little ways to make money, and people just scream bloody murder. Yeah, they do. And it's like, you know, guys, you, they can't keep continue to run this thing with with no revenue source. So yeah, in, in, don't be obnoxious. But if you want to throw an ad in my stream once in a while, I I can live with it. Um, if you want to do a promoted tweet, that's that's fine too. Um, I, I I strongly don't like the way Facebook does it. Because mm -hmm. I, I never know if, if you if, – if, if Facebook – well, you're not on. But if Facebook does not consider what you're posting interesting enough, it will never show up in my timeline. Even though you might have posted 50 things, I don't see it. So I think Chris is dead. He drowned at the beach. And, and that, happens. Yeah. And that, 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 that bothers me a lot. That's one reason I think I've just completely resisted Facebook as a, as a place I regularly go. In fact, I, I cheat. Because I have my Twitter feed cross post to my Facebook feed, yeah. so people at least people know I'm over there, and then if they send me a message on Facebook, I'll get an email about it, and and I know to go and look. But you know, it's just that that's the big downside to me to Facebook, Google Plus, better, interesting implementation, not mm -hmm. not as wide an audience yet. I think they're still working on it. I hope, but you know, it's it has its own problems. So. Yeah, I mean, my disdain for Facebook is based entirely on their cynical attitude, which is they believe they have a right to every bit of information I have. That's how they make their money. They, the more they know about me, and okay, if you step back from the whole moral issue of it, which I think is reprehensible, but if you look at it purely from a business standpoint, we've tried to monetize by throwing the same ad at millions of people, and maybe 1% of them are interested enough to click on the ad. Well, doesn't it make more sense if instead of seeing, you know, 99% of people don't care about whatever it is you're advertising, that everybody that you show this particular ad to are going to be interested in it because you know enough about them to know that they're going to like it. So let's say I just got an Xbox One and I've been out hunting for games and they know that and they know I've purchased this, that, and the other game. Well, wouldn't it make sense to market a, this fifth game that's going to come out that they know I'm going to like? So, of course, it makes a ton of sense. But there's the issue of, but maybe I don't want you to have that information. Maybe that's my information, and I haven't voluntarily given it to you. I posted something on my page about it because I thought it was interesting for people that I hang out with, and we share a common interest. But then when you choose to just go in there and grab it and then shove ads at me or to take my aggregate information and then sell it off to some advertiser, that's where I start to have a problem with it. And the fact is that, Facebook has shown no shame about doing any of this stuff, that when they implement new privacy policies, they make them difficult to turn off, or they don't tell you about them. Um, they're going after kids. They want younger and younger people to be on Facebook when you know they say, oh, yeah, well, the parents can supervise them. Well, they know kids aren't going to be supervised. They're going to do all kinds of things on there that they shouldn't be doing. So um, you know, the attraction of being able to share your life is, is very tempting. But it's, um, again, it's back to the cake thing. I don't think it's good for us to do that all the time. And I don't care for companies to take advantage of human weakness that way and to exploit it so that they can make money off it. I think Mark Zuckerberg personally seems to be a good guy. And then he puts lots of money into education and, and good things, much like Bill Gates does. But I think that the outfit that he's running and the attitude that he's instilled that privacy doesn't matter, and Google is guilty of the same thing, is abhorrent. I think it's um, it's not good for us as a civilization, and um, I'm sorry that we've all kind of said, "Well, yeah, let's let's come to our base ourselves and support this kind of thing." Instead of saying, "No, you've gone too far. You can't do that." Whereas Apple, kind of jumping off, but I think this is important with the iPhone six and the six plus, where they built in security uh, protocols so that the NSA and the FBI can't get in and law enforcement can't get in there. I think that's wonderful that 
somebody like Apple is marketing privacy as a feature. I think the fact that, I mean, they're smart people and they know that this is going to be attraction for a lot of people. And um, I hope that catches on. And that, I mean, we're seeing services like Ello come out, which is supposed to be a Facebook competitor. I don't think the service is very good yet, but their whole platform is, it's all about privacy. We know you're sick of companies like Facebook taking your information. So that's heartening, you know, that maybe there's a backlash. And finally, people are saying they're ignoring the Eric Schmitz of the world who say privacy doesn't matter and it doesn't exist. At least they're making an effort, you know, instead of saying, all right, we give up, fine, just take everything you can from us. But saying, no, this is enough. You've gone too far. We want to have our privacy. It, it may be an illusion, but we'd like to maintain that illusion instead of you rubbing our face in the fact that you know everything there is to know about us. Sometimes, just to mess with them, I, I, I like to go and click a link that says, you know, I'm interested in buying a bulldozer. Just, uh, you see a lot of bulldozer ads after that? Well, you, you know, you'd be surprised at, at what can pop up in your stream if yeah. you go and just pick something completely random. And you, you just, you, you'd like to believe that somewhere in a basement somewhere that I've just confused the daylights out of the algorithms. I don't know if I have, but it makes me feel They good. don't cry. Algorithms don't cry. <laughs> There's your show title. <laughs> yeah. I don't do show titles, they, but I, if I did. If you did, that would be, yeah. Because yeah. they don't, they don't care, you know, and plus they probably, you know, they probably have this guy screwing with me, <laughs> intelligence built in there, like, hmm, he's been clicking on a lot of Xbox stuff and suddenly the bulldozer. Yeah. Okay, we're going to plate that one out and then we're going to continue shoving this other stuff out. Yeah, him. that's the truth. Chris, we never get together enough. It's always, it's always interesting to dig in and see where the discussions go. Uh, but thank you for being here. And I'm glad you're still with Macworld and our best to the to the the new team and hope to see you back here and we'll be watching all the great stuff you'll be doing. Thank you very much. It's always great to be here. I, I love bloviating. So and uh, and yours is the best show for doing it because you just let me go. Thank you, I think. <laughs> No, it's good. <laughs> On that note, I'm, I'm like I said, I never listen back, so it could be you just edit out everything and they're like, yeah, okay, seven words from Chris Breen. Here they are. Okay, yeah, I, I, I've I've been complimented because I allow my guests to bloviate. I don't know, I don't know. Well, you know, I insist on it, so it's okay. in my contract. <laughs> we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chuck. Folks, I'm a very confused Chuck Joyner right now. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. We'll be back again, hopefully, with maybe not so much bloviating, but a lot of stuff to make you think. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. <laughs>